Okay. Um, I want to turn to your personal life, if you will, um, for a second. Y- y- your son, I believe it it was your oldest or, or your youngest son. Well, I I gave a lot for the for the agency and for my country. And one of mm-hmm. the things that I really dread uh, was not being around for my children. And uh, my oldest son uh, took his life. And that really, that really took me for a spin. If I was ever down, depressed, that was when my son, uh, you know, took his life. And uh, one of the things that he said was that nobody loved him. So I, I carried that, and I still carry that deeply in my heart. Uh, I wasn't around for my kids. I was, as I told you, I was out of country a lot of times. I was with, I, w- I was not with him when, when I was in dangerous countries. So I couldn't bring him. So there was a lot of birthdays, baseball games, and family uh, things that uh, I did not participate in, and I feel very guilty about that to this day. I would not recommend anybody to go work with a DEA or be uh, a government agent. When, when he did take his life, uh, were you stateside? Yes, sir. I was. Uh, he uh, he was living in Arizona, and I was living in California. How how was your relationship with him? Uh, in his final days, did you guys have a chance to bond? I know he said nobody loved him, but did you have any moments of at least trying to get that relationship back on track, not knowing that this is the way it would end? Yes, uh, we we had talked like a, a week or two before he was he was coming to California, and him and my other son Chris had planned to. Uh, uh, set up a campsite on the beach, and and as a matter of fact, they they went out and bought home and lamps and and sleeping bags, and they we were planning a big a big uh, camping trip uh, here. He was coming, he was driving up from California, and so, so we had been talking to him. I mean, we had I had a good relationship with, with him. When he said that that he nobody loved him was because his wife was cheating on him with another man, and she had told him that she was gonna leave him and go live with the other man, which he did. And um, one night uh, he went out and drank a little too much, I guess, and he came home and and he had his kids there because he had two kids before he got with her. And uh, he uh, he just took his life and he, he told his kids, nobody loves me and and took his life. I, I, I don't think he was referring to me. I think he was referring more to his woman. I'm so sorry to hear that. My condolences. I, I, I hear the hurt in your voice, even as you're telling this story. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm Again, my condolences, and I'm so, so sorry. Because like you said, you have given so much um, to this country, to the government, um, to us, for our freedoms. You know, it, it hasn't been an easy ride for you. And this is happening right before you were essentially forced into retirement, correct? That's correct. So your life, it went from being somewhat of a of a superhero, a decorated agent for many years, to all of a sudden pain, sorrow, and life as you know it came completely to an end. What, what did you do after retirement? Well, like I said, I went to, for a while there. I went through a very major depression, and I reevaluated my life, Sean. And I started thinking, you know, here I've killed people for the government. I have taken lives. More than the one shootout that I had uh, talked about earlier, I made another shootout where I had to kill other people. And I had a reflection and thought, what was it all about? Here, I got involved in shootouts with drug dealers that were dealing little drugs, a pound or two of coke or heroin or what have you, when my own government was bringing in tons. And I thought to myself, how can I continue doing this job? I can't. I can't continue doing this job because I don't believe in this job anymore. There's no equal justice here. If if, 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 if you're poor, I don't care if you're black, white, Mexican. If you're poor and you're out there committing a crime to try to support your family, which is drug dealing, and, and, and I'm, I'm arresting you and putting you away for 15, 20 years. 
And then I know that our government is bringing in drugs by the ton load. And I know that our country has caused the cocaine epidemic of the 80s and 90s. All the blacks that were uh, having crack babies and the Chicanos all, all, all arrested and all. You know, I started, I started thinking, what was my career all about? I mean, seriously, how do you think I feel? You think I would want to go out and arrest anybody right now? I can't. And they can deny it all they want. They can, they can say, well, it's not true. It is true. At, at this point in your life, do you sleep through the night? Is, is there a moment's peace? Because what you just said the gravity of it, the magnitude of it, I mean, it cuts deep. And, 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 and it is, it's sincere and it's the truth. You know, there, there are guys that are locked up that will never come home, that never sold a quarter, a quarter of the weight of the drugs that the U.S. government brought into this country. Have you found any peace? Have you found a way to live with yourself and, 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 and sleep through the night? Like I said, Sean, it does bother me a lot. It doesn't bother me too much when I think of the people they arrested. It bothers me when I think of the people that I killed. That bothers me because they're, not, they're no longer alive. And they weren't selling tons, maybe a pound or two of heroin or something like that. And they just didn't want to get arrested. And they pulled guns, so it was gunplay, and people people got shot, people got killed. And I say to myself now, um, God, forgive me. You know, one of the shootouts that I was involved in, um, it was a, it was, it was three guys that were armed. They were from Sinaloa, from the Sinaloa cartel. And... Um, they delivered the heroin. I gave the bus signal. And when the, my agents were coming in to make the arrest, they started pulling out guns. So I, I shot and killed one of them. And when he was laying there, actually my partner and I, Bobby Bags, uh, both, we both shot him and killed him. But he was laying there uh, in the ground. And his last words were, Manny, forgive me, I'm sorry. And I'm, I'm stepping on his arm because he's still laying there with a gun. And I see his eyes roll back and he dies. And to this day it haunts me because I tell you to myself, was he telling me he was sorry because he knew uh, I was a DEA agent and he knew he was done something wrong? Or was he telling me he was just sorry for being a bad guy? I don't know. But that's what he told me. He says, forgive me, I'm so sorry. After I shot him and killed him. I mean, that bothers me a lot sometimes. I, I have nightmares about that. He called you Manny. That was my undercover so name. That was your undercover name. Yes. So do you think that even in the end, he didn't realize that you worked for the government? I don't know. That's what, I, that's what bothers me. Did he really think I was still a crook? But, but I shot him. He must have known I shot him. But did he apologize to me? He said he was sorry. I don't know. To this day, I don't know if he thought I was still a crook or if he knew that I was a federal agent and I had, had shot him uh, in the chest, by the way, and uh, very close range. I don't know. It bothers me to this day. Yeah. I, you know, John, let me tell you a little story here before we end. Uh, uh, before I retired, I was asked to give a... Um, a presentation of the Camarena case to all the sacks of the entire DEA. And it was up here in Northern California, Morro Bay, we had a conference room. And, uh, you know, I was an undercover guy. I hardly ever wore a suit or a tie or anything like that. I was, I always dressed cowboy like I am because I'm a cowboy, Western. And uh, so my sack calls me in and he says, uh, Hector, he says, uh, I want you, they, they want you to give a presentation of the Camarena murder case. Uh, so I want you to do that. But he says, would you do me a favor? And I said, what's that, boss? He said, would you dress in a suit? Would you have a, wear a nice suit with a tie, please? And I said, I will. I said, no problem. I'll, I'll, I'll dress in a suit. 
So the morning of the uh, of the conference, I, I I put my wore my suit, and I always carried my gun on my waist. And I thought, you know what? I can't carry a gun like this in front of all these sacks. So I said, mm, I'm going to wear a shoulder holster, which I had bought a long time ago. It was brand new. I had never worn it, my shoulder holster. So I said, I'll wear a shoulder holster and my coat over it. So I did. So I, had, I ended up getting at the conference there, and finally my turn comes up to brief the the, uh, the sacks. And I'm getting up there, and I have photographs of Caro Quintero and Fonseca and all the drug lords and blah, blah. And it's warm, so I take my coat off, and I have my gun in a shoulder holster. And the deputy administrator of the DEA says to me, Hector, is that gun necessary? And it kind of upset me that he asked me that. And I said, you know what? And I was behind the microphone. I said, you know what? When I will go undercover sometimes, I don't carry a gun. But when I'm here with you guys, I need my gun. <laughs> and a lot of them started laughing. But that's the way I really felt. I felt a lot of times more comfortable with the crooks. I found that some of the crooks were more honorable than some of the guys that I worked with in the DEA. Wow. Wow. 